Okay, so uh, the second lecture, um, we covered some foundations uh, last week. Um, today is going to be a lot more uh, pragmatic, uh, but uh, uh, we'll just um, define some fundamental, some basic basic quantities, and see some of their properties. So from last week's notes. Uh, thermodynamics is a geometrical theory. Properties of matter and the direction of natural processes are encoded into the slopes and curvatures of a surface. Information is extracted by taking derivatives. Conversely, the surface can be reconstructed if given sufficient underlying information. So today we're going to see how, how that's done. Again, today, next week, we're going to see how that's done. And um, today, most of it's going to actually be written on the board. So today, the outline for today is, uh, first of all, we'll start with a fundamental relation and show how to get the equations of state. Uh, basically, the way we do it is that uh, we assign labels. We work in the en start with the energy representation. In other words, we take the internal energy to be the fundamental relation. We assign labels to the first derivatives and show that these have all the properties we expect of temperature and pressure. So on. Um, then we do the same thing for uh, the entropy representation, where the fundamental relation is the entropy function. Now, since the derivatives themselves are functions of S, V, and N, or U, V, and N, they must correspond to the equation of state, and um, we define them to be so. As we will see more and more examples, we see that this is correct. Now, uh, there's no there is no theorem that can possibly say that derivatives of the fundamental relation are uh, what experimentalists call equations of state. The, the theory produces, the theory has this structure, the theory has a space, has slots for, for these quantities, and we show that when we get these quantities using mathematical operations, that they actually correspond with the experiment. That's how physical theories work. So if you're a theoretical physicist, um, most of the time uh, you'd be working with some mathematical structures, mathematical model or scheme, and uh, that will, uh, it's, in fact, it's like a, a, a method, uh, ideas expressed mathematically. Those have to connect with experiment. The true test of any theory is agreement with experiment. There is no theorem that can possibly say that experiments must conform to the theory. That's ridiculous. Okay. Right. And the person who told me that was Eugene Bashkin, who was my PhD supervisor. Um, we can also go the other way, from equations of state to the fundamental relation. <coughs> so we can recover the fundamental relation if we know enough equations of state. And there are two cases uh, uh, which we'll um, get to later. Um, if we know all three equations, all three equations of state, because we have uh, three possible derivatives here. Three possible derivatives. We're just considering a relatively simple situation, which is very general and probably what most of you will need for the rest of your life. Um, just a function of three thermodynamic variables. Right? Um, but they don't have to be V. It could be mag magnetic, uh, um, total magnetic moment. could be total electric uh, dipole moment. Um, could be any extensive parameter that comes here that can be changed in order to do work on the substance. Um, so if we know all three equations of state, then we can substitute them into what's known as the order equation, which we'll see later. And the second case, we may know two out of the three, two out of three equations of state, then we need to use either the Gibbs-Jordan relation or we uh, integrate with what's called the molar fundamental relation. And so here are some key topics and key words that you can have a look at. Um, Later. So, so uh, the summary for what I'm doing first is uh, is that there differentiate the fundamental relation to give the equation of state, and uh, in the energy representation, the uh, these are the uh, intensive variables in the energy representation, and these are the intensive variables in the entropy representation, the entropic 
intensive parameters, and these are the energy uh, energy uh, energy intensive parameters. Okay, so now I'm going to start writing. So this is um, uh, SB2. 2017 lecture two. So I want to slow things right down, and just so that everything sinks in. So we have the start. So we have the uh, fundamental relation in the uh, energy representation. <laughs> So it's the internal energy. And this is, remember, we're always talking about an isolated system. So, so U is the, for, the, for the fundamental relation in an isolated system, the, uh, the fundamental relation is a function of intent, extensive parameters only, S, V, and N. Now, in general, uh, you may have N1 moles of substance 1, N2 moles of substance 2, NR moles of substance R. Um, we just um, uh, keep it simple. I was going to write keep it simple, stupid, but I <laughs> Keep it simple. Um, so that's just have U equals U of S V. N, okay, and that's really um, all you need for many applications. Uh, so, so the differential uh, du is well uh, du uh, du by ds at constant v and n. And remember, in thermodynamics, it's essential to to write which variables you are keeping constant when you take the partial derivative. So this is the, the slope of the U surface in, in the direction of the S variable, okay? So that's where V and N variables are held constant. The other two uh, partial derivatives are DU by DV at constant S and N, uh, DV, and then plus DU by DN at constant S and V, N. Okay. Now this partial derivative, this slope, we're going to give the label T, and this partial derivative we're going to give the label minus P, and these three lines are kind of, I'm going to say, are identified with or defined to be something like that. Okay. Um, and these, this three, this one is going to be the chemical, oops, sorry, mu. I won't say what it actually is. Now, since the, the function u is a function of s, v, and n, the slopes are also a function of s, v, and n. And this one will give the name temperature. This one will give the name pressure. In fact, it's the uh, negative pressure, negative of the pressure. And this one would give the name the chemical potential. So that, so we can write. Uh, du equals T D S minus P D V plus mu D N. Now we compare this to the first law of thermodynamics. which is du equals the imperfect differential dq 
plus imperfect differential dw, and I put a subscript here, um, mac, which I'll explain in a minute, and imperfect differential um, all other kinds, w all other kinds, especially h. So, uh, it's particularly, uh, the, these ones, that there is a type of DW, that there is also a type of DW, um, but really, uh, the one where I want to look at is DQ, uh, comparing these to DQ equals TDS. And, uh, you'll notice that the DQ is an imperfect differential, whereas on the right hand side we have a perfect differential DS and a, and a function T, which is a well defined function. So a, an imperfect differential is converted to, if you like, a perfect differential DS by dividing by this function T. In the theory, which I'll mention next week, um, the temperature, or T, is an integrating factor for dQ. And just like the integrating factors that uh, you saw in MP1 uh, for separable equations, an integrating factor um, makes, the separate, makes an, an o, a PDE or ODE separable. And then uh, it converts it into it converts the function that you're looking for into a function that depends only on the endpoints, which is just like a just like a potential energy, or just like a potential in classical mechanics, a conservative system, if you like. Okay, so that's the the, the mathematics ends up being exactly the same. Anyway, so this is the dQ is the heat absorbed. by a substance. Now if there's an equal sign here, there's an equal sign there, and it equals TDS, that only happens when you have a quasi-static process, so in a quasi-static process. This is DW mechanical. Uh, this is the mechanical work done on the system. Well, on the on the system uh, due to a change in volume and just uh, due to. Uh, mm, does it have to be a change in volume? I don't think so. I think that um, I, I won't do that. I won't say that. Um, in this case, if you have minus PDV, then obviously it's due to a change in volume. But I could have a magnetized substance where the magnets are all pointing in one direction, and and they're pointing in one direction. Uh, for example, because I've applied an external magnetic field, and if I turn the external magnetic field around. Uh, that actually does work uh, on the um, on the um, dipoles, and so that's a way of uh, putting energy into the system. You can do work on the system by changing the external magnetic field. But would that be categorized as mechanical work? Mm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, the thing is that in magnetic systems, you don't have a minus PDV. Wouldn't it be mechanical because the person actually doing the work is us? Because magnetic forces don't really do work. Right. So it's something else is doing the work. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Mm. But anyway, the, the point is that um, really there's DQ and there's everything else. Okay, that's the main thing. DQ is special. This, all this stuff here is uh, work. Here, this is associated with a form of energy known as heat. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Is DQ a definition? Sorry? Is DQ a definition? As in, is, the, is that the definition of DQ? No, we did it last week. Define the heat. As the difference between the general and the general. Yeah. yeah. In an adiabatic process. Don't you? Yeah. Measuring is an adiabatic process. <coughs> yeah. Okay? Right, so, so now we have um, T is a function of SVN minus P is a function of SVN and U is a function of SVN and these are called the equations of state. We will call these the equations of state. Um, by the way, if you look at that, how do you know that we are working in the energy representation? There's no energy terms in the field. Correct. These are all functions of extensive parameters and energy does not appear in here. This is the independent variables, the variables that are controlled by the experiment are S, V and N, not U, V and N. So these are the, equa uh, the equations of state uh, this by itself, uh, of course, uh, that, that must equal, that's not an equation. Um, an equation is this equals, what I had, is this equals du by d um, s at constant vn. If, you, if I write what I have here, these are the equations of state. That equals that, that equals that, that equals that. These are the equations of state. Okay? So, in fact, um, as to make these equations, you have to have equal signs here. These are the, and the partial derivatives come on the right-hand side. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Okay, <coughs> question. How do these quantities scale with the size of the system? So if you ever want to answer that question, you replace the extensive parameters, which in this case are S, V and N, with lambda S, lambda V, lambda N. Now, T of S, V and N is defined as du by ds at constant vn and what is t of lambda s lambda v lambda n well that's du now u is a function of lambda s lambda v lambda n by d lambda s where you know, and, and, and just for shorthand, I'm not going to I'm not going to put in these brackets and say constant lambda b, constant lambda n. Right? I mean, to be ultra pedantic, you would have to put those there, but let's not worry about it. Now, so the denominator that lambda is just a real number, so that comes out of the differential leaving ds and what's the internal energy as a function of lambda s lambda v lambda n it's lambda u it's lambda u so that means that must be lambda du of s v n because the internal energy uh, is an extensive quantity it scales with the size of the system um, so lambda cancel, so that's du by ds, which equals t of s v s. Um, therefore, t does not scale with the size of the system. Whether something is extensive or not, we tell that purely on like physical reason. Like, uh, but um, a true experiment, but not 
theoretically important? It is. Um, it's. It's. Um, it's. Um, um, I mean, from the it's, it's Euler, Euler's theory theories. Euler, Euler's theory of um, um, uh, surfaces. There was a there was an example even in MP one in the second second or third assignment or something. Um, but this is this comes from differential geometry. This is yeah. this is uh, this is this is just geometry. And it happens to correspond with a useful physical property. So T does not scale with the size of the system. We, we call this an intensive parameter. At various times, you will see slight variations of this word. This could be um, some. It's called uh, interior parameter or something. Um, Internal, internal, internal. Um, yeah, internal parameter. Various, various uh, modifications uh, of this, but they all mean the same thing. Okay. So obviously, the same proof. be given for minus p and mu. That, yeah, so basically uh, temperature is homogeneous order zero. Homogeneous order zero. And this is homogeneous order one. Uh, U is homogeneous order one. Extensive parameters are homogeneous order one. So for this basic thermodynamic theory, what's useful are surfaces homogeneous order zero, homogeneous order one. But you can get homogeneous order two, all sorts of things. Okay. So now let's have an isolated system in equilibrium. Pictorially, looks like this. And so this is meant to be a rigid, this is this is meant to be a rigid uh, this wall is rigid um abiotic. And impermeable. So you can't do work on it from outside. Um, in fact, I could actually allow this wall to expand outward into nothing. That's allowable in the theory. Okay, it is actually allowable. If it, this one of the, 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 these walls can expand into nothing, free expansion. That's also allowable. Right? Um, adiabatic and impermeable. So adi no heat and no particles get out. So if you partition the system into lambda macroscopic Subsystems, then by definition of equilibrium, each subsystem has T equals T of S. B N. So this idea of equilibrium is really, really, really fundamental in the, this theory. Right. 
So through the, in this whole year, uh, nearly all the time we'll be talking about equilibrium thermodynamics and equilibrium statistical mechanics. For just a short period, in like lecture nine or something, we'll be talking about non -equilibrium, the, the, the path to equilibrium. So, by, so each subsystem is also in equilibrium, and they're not allowed to be too small, because if they're too small, then the molecular nature becomes apparent. So they have to be macroscopic. So then, take the union of all these subsystems And you get, what do you get? You get um, whatever the entropy was in one subsystem, you get lambda of S. Whatever the volume is in one subsystem, you get lambda V. And whatever number of particles, number of moles, it's the number of moles of particles. In the total system, you get lambda N. And the temperature of this whole thing must equal T of S V N. So this is the physical interpretation of what it means to be homogeneous order zero. Okay. So this means, but this has a very interesting consequence. This means that we can consider a simple subsystem And it contains all the information for the whole system. So you divide all the extensive variables by n. So u equals u over n, etc. And you get du equals d little u by d little s at constant little v ds plus du by d little v at constant s d little v but d little u by d little s at constant v equals d little u by d little s um, at constant big V and constant big N. So I've just replaced that with that. But then that also equals du by d. If, if N is now constant, then, um, then I can go, um, this is now capital S and capital V, capital N, because u is big u over n, so I can go, I can go like multiply by n on n here, and I'll get that. Bring those inside the differentials, or inside the differentials, like that, and you get d big u by d big s, so that's t. Uh, similarly, uh, d little u by d little V at constant S equals minus P for, um, for, for the same reasoning. So in other words, this partial derivative is just T and this partial derivative is minus P. So what we have is D little u 
equals t d little s minus t d little v. And this is the molar form. of the infinitesimal volume is sorry infinitesimal variation of the U. Yeah. Can you explain again the votes and the So The little u by d little s at constant little v is the same as um, d little u by d little s at um, actually little v on n. So v and n can actually change as long as that's constant. Oh, actually, but this is certainly true. Uh, this is slightly more general because little v can be constant. You, you can double the volume and double the number of particles at the same time, and little v will be the same. Um, but it's still, this is certainly true that this is equal. Um, which equals n on n d little u by d little s at constant v n, which equals D N U little U over D N little S plus the B N which equals D B U by D B S B N which equals T. That's just yeah. Why do you have a N B N appearing uh, at this uh, at the first equality? Yeah. Um, yeah. Ah, yeah. Um, what we want to do is to bring in the number of moles into the into this into the partial derivative. So what I want to do is to show that in fact that there is the temperature. So do you, but it's not like n time. It's not like it's exactly the temperature. Do little u by little s. That's that's the point. So I need to bring in. Um, I need to put big N into the, into the equation somehow. I need to bring it in somehow. So it, essentially I'm going from the molar form to the extensive form. Okay. So you've got to be doing that fairly often in the next few weeks. So Professor, if, if little b is constant, that doesn't mean that V and N are constant? Not necessarily, right? It, it could be that it means that V and N change in proportion. Yeah. But uh, we want to just have a particular case where N is constant. Also, oh, it's like we one on one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's T. Um, okay, so let's start. Okay. So, oh, yeah, okay, so now, up to now, we started, uh, we have been working in the energy rep representation. Now, start with the entropy, now as a function of u, v, and n. So, and um, just the same sort, of, same sort of argument, we have one on t, u, v, n is defined as 
ds by du at constant v and n. P of u, v and n divided by t of u, v and n is defined as ds by dv at constant u and n. And mu of u, v and n over t of u, v and n is defined as ds by dn a constant u v so this is these are the um, entropic intensive parameters entropic intensive parameters the way to get them is uh, well, yeah, you can you can have a count on count. The Kobe's? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it's fine. We can use the last last lecture we worked with some relations starting from the implicity. There are lots of different ways, but yeah. Okay, so that's just some um, basic definitions. So, thermal equilibrium So, basically what we're doing now is how do we know that, now we've called this T function a temperature How do we know that it really is a temperature? So, here's something about condensed matter physics and thermodynamics which is not the case in other sorts of physics, especially something like high energy physics. Often, usually, often, typically. In, in condensed matter physics, you come up with a mathematical object that appears to be the temperature because it conforms to certain mathematical steps, the logical steps. But, to, but then you have to actually prove that this thing that uh, is ostensibly the temperature really does behave like the temperature. And you, you prove it using higher principles. Okay? It's a typical step in condensed matter physics. So in condensed matter physics, appearances and reductionless thinking as well just doesn't happen. It's a lot, it's, it's a lot more um, holistic because you have to think of general principles all the time. So that's, a big, that's quite a big difference in thinking between condensed matter physics and high energy physics. Of course, some high energy physicists immediately probably come up with some counter examples, but, but this is just my impression. Anyway, isolated system with two subsystems. There's a wall. There's the isolated system. And there's subsystem one and subsystem two. Uh, to start off with, this is an immovable, impenetrable, impenetrable partition. which will conduct heat when we when we say so flick a switch or something so two sub and these are subsystems in equilibrium in equilibrium individually, individually. Initially, the partition is adiabatic. So, it, so there's a partition. It's just made two isolated subsystems, and we've waited a long time 
so that they're by the, that's in equilibrium with itself and that's in equilibrium with itself. Almost certainly two completely different temperatures. But what we do know initially is that um, with is that the initial internal energy of subsystem one and um, initial internal energy of subsystem two, these are known. And therefore, we know the total U, Ui1 plus Ui2 is some, is known. And it equals constant, well, conservation of energy Now, allow the partition to conduct heat. After equilibrium is re-established, in the combined system, composite system, composite system, what is the final temperature? Well, uh, the thing is that all we have is one equation. But what we know, what we need is uh, a final temperature. Uh, the total energy U. We know the total energy U at the end. Um, it's just whatever it is, some some number. Um, but we need a temperature, which is a derivative, um, and we don't have enough information. We need one more equation from somewhere. So what do you reckon the equation is going to come from? Conservation of entropy. There's no such thing as conservation of entropy. Entropy, entropy, maximum. entropy maximum principle. We must use the entropy maximum principle uh, to get one more equation. And so the entropy maximum principle is ds equals zero. Obviously, um, d2s is less than zero, um, but um, one we, we we don't need this until we study phase transitions. What do you mean by d2s? The so say second derivative. Oh, so so, so it's concave, concave, concave down. Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's maximum. It's maximum, so they're going to be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got to be like that. Yeah. Hey, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, three. <laughs> I keep getting this the wrong way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, it's, right. Right. Yeah, it's, it's got to be like that. It's a maximum. Yeah, right. Okay. Um. Now, six. By additivity. of the entropy, S total equals S, the entropy of the first subsystem, and it's a function of the first subsystem variables, plus the entropy of the second subsystem, which is a function of the second subsystem variables. So in fact, um, S is a function of six variables. 
Um, now the volumes are the same, the numbers of numbers of moles are the same. So these two variables are, uh, are, are constant. Uh, U1 and U2 is what changes. So it's really actually a function of two variables, but four are constant. And um, need U1 and U2. Um, so you need two, we have two unknowns and one equation, except we're going to use the entropy maximum principle to give us a second equation. Okay? So one more equation from the entropy maximum principle, ds equals zero. So ds total equals ds1 plus ds2 because s total equals s1 plus s2. Um, and since the only variables that are changing are the internal energy of, of the subsystems, ds1 or du1, du1 plus ds2 by du2, du2, and that's a constant um, constant these four those four variables are constant so I'm not going to bother writing it out okay, you're going to get a whole row of variables here and I don't want to write that out because it would be too messy so that's at constant um, that but ds1 by du1 is 1 on t1 and ds2 by du2 is 1 on t2 and now um, what do you think the next step is? We're going to need, we're going to use ds total. The the entropy of the isolated system must be maximum when the subsystem when it is in equilibrium. So that's going to eventually equal zero. And what we, what do we need in order for this to be helpful? I mean, uh, what other information do we use? Okay, use conservation of energy. So um, you what? Well, conservation of energy. We know that U1 plus U2 equals constant. And but that implies that DU1 equals minus DU2. And now you substitute that into, into here. So that implies DS total is one on T1 minus 1 on T2, du1 equals 0 at the final equilibrium. Or in the final equilibrium, equilibrium state. And um, so this equals zero, du1 is arbitrary, therefore this coefficient must be zero. And of course that means that the temperatures of the subsystems must be equal. Yep. And you mean that the U1 is arbitrary? Um, it can have any size, it's not zero. So that can be zero if either that's zero or that's zero, but DE1 is not necessarily zero. In fact, it's, it, it, it can be zero, 
if one on T1 and one on T2, if T1 are all, uh, is equal to T2 from the start, but usually, not usually, but um, it's, it's not necessarily zero, and therefore T1 must equal T2. But it's not arbitrary. It's it is it defined by something, by a system dynamic. It, it, it can, it, this does not necessarily mean the limit as delta tends to zero of u2 minus u1. I guess you can say that you can choose to transfer whatever amount of energy you want from one system to another. Exactly. Yeah. Good. That's a really good way of saying it. So what, what we really mean by using the language of this total D, what we really mean is you know, if you use, if you see Goldstein, Goldstein uses the proper proper notation for this sort of thing. It's this delta. This is like a fixed amount of energy, and this doesn't even have to be that small. It depends on, as I kind of said last last week, this doesn't have to be very small. It depends on what small means for the system. It depends on how small the energy transfer has to be in order for first order terms to be the only important ones. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, uh, you're actually going to see some examples in you know, three or four weeks when we do some calculations. So in thermodynamics, what this means depends on the system. It could mean, you know, you, you can, there's an experiment that you can do, in fact, um, they do it at the University of Western Australia in second year. Uh, adiabatic um, expansion of the gas, they have a big bottle at the top and, and, and they, they, have a, they have a gas in there and then they, there's, a, there's a plug there, they take it off, they take the plug off, they take the plug off for 20 seconds or something and they put it back on and it, you may think that um, that that is not uh, that, that, that is not an oscillator system, it is not an adiabatic change and so, and so on and so on but for that particular system it is so it depends on um, relaxation times, um, how quickly information is transmitted in the system and that sort of thing. So that du can mean different numbers, different amounts, but they're all small, whatever small means in that system. Um, so what we've just discovered is that this T function that we've um, defined by the partial derivative of the of a of a, of a function of three variables or uh, any number of variables um, actually behaves as we would expect it to um, if a system is a, if, as a temperature of a system that's in equilibrium. Okay. Um, another, you can go a little bit further than that and. And I can um, reprise the argument, uh, say, um, furthermore, I can see Callan um, section 2.5. Um, suppose we have two subsystems. of an isolated system, uh, not in equilibrium, uh, such that T1 is greater than T2. Um, so we have um, two subsystems separately in equilibrium, separ separately in equilibrium with each other. No, with, with uh, internally, but obviously not with each other. Because the temperatures are different. Okay, so we've got like the situation that we had at the start of the, the, pre, the, the previous bit, right? Two subsystems and T1 is greater than T2. Professor, what do you mean by it? It means that 
initially this partition is completely adiabatic, impermeable and immovable so that these are two isolated subsystems and they are in equilibrium. One is in equilibrium and two is in equilibrium but not with each other. They have different temperatures so they can't be in equilibrium with each other. So now um, allow heat transfer Um, heat flows um, heat flows across the wall the internal wall it flows across the wall um, the isolated system moves towards equilibrium, towards an equilibrium state. Therefore, the change in entropy of the isolated system total is greater than zero. Okay. So initially, whatever the entropy was initially, it must be less than what it will be at the end when the isolated system is in equilibrium and these two subsystems are in equilibrium with each other. So the final equilibrium, the entropy is there and it started off being here somewhere. So delta S is greater than zero, SF minus SI is positive. Um, now, ds equals 1 on t1 minus 1 on t2 d1 now if um, if the final state is not too far from the initial state then we can have the finite change is approximately equal to 1 on T1 minus 1 on T2 delta U1 so notice here we have small, very small changes or small changes and here we have finite changes is a good finite. Even though this is a finite change, this is a small finite change, this is a bigger finite change. So it must be the, big, the, the delta S would be larger. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's why, see, you, you can't have an equal sign here. It's got to be approximately, but you're not too far away, so it's not like way off. Um, and these are the Initial values, by the way, they were they are they these partial derivatives were evaluated at the initial uh, time, or at the initial states. Remember, that's where these so these are initial values of temperature. But uh, by assumption, T one is greater than T two. So that there is smaller than that. 1 over T1 is smaller than 1 on T2. So that this number here is less than 0. But the change in entropy has got to be greater than 0. Therefore, the change in internal energy of the first um, subsystem must be less than zero. That's negative, so that's going to be negative in order to make the product positive. Okay. I.e. heat uh, flowed. What's the 
past tense of flow, flow, isn't it? Flow. Yeah, flow. Okay. <laughs> Heat flowed. I've been to back in Japan for too long. <laughs> Heat flowed from the system with high T to the one with low temperature. Okay. So, so T is is defined as these two things, uh, other than the definition, which is the partial derivative yeah. of u. It's the characteristics, characteristics of what we call a temperature is determined by the fact that T of a system in equilibrium is almost homogeneous, and that it, it's also a measure of energy, as in if one system has more T than the other, then that heat flows from this system to this system. Yeah. So, 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 uh, so, what what we mean by what do you mean by temperature? What 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 do we what have we been told temperature is from like year eight in some high school or whatever? Average kinetic energy. But yeah, so but you're not allowed to talk about kinetic energy in thermodynamics because we don't care about we don't look at the microscopic constituents. It's just a state. So we're looking at the the property of the state. So if the state is in equilibrium, then the temperature is the same. In every um, sub, sub every partition of it, as long as it's macroscopic. And secondly, uh, heat flows from systems of high temperature to systems of low temperature. And so, this mathematical object that we've discovered, or you know, so we discovered, um, conforms to those intuitive physical ideas. And so, it looks like we're onto something. But will it be? As in, yeah. That's a very good question. Um, in fact, in fact, it is, but uh, the the experimental temperature is not unique. So you can read the section on temperature units two six and Kellen, um, and there's an excellent section on this question. Um, obviously, Fahrenheit. You can have temperature in Fahrenheit or Celsius, for example, and Kelvin. So it's not unique. Um, there's experimental temperature, uh, and there's um, and there's the absolute temperature. So what we're talking about is the absolute temperature. Um, there's an excellent chapter or section section in uh, Zemansky and Dittman on this. As I said before, Zemansky and Dittman is really great uh, for connecting thermodynamics with experiment. And so if you're interested in finding out more, um, read that. But that's an important question. And indeed, uh, the absolute temperature is unique. Yeah. You said what P1 is greater than P2? Yeah. Is that just by assumption? Or okay, you can have it the other way. And then and then you, you get, get the option. Yeah, so, so it's, it's just an assumption. It's not really. It's a, it based on our set. Without loss of generality, without loss of generality. If it's this way, it's that. Yeah, 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 but I mean, I, it's, it's, it's just. Um, if you have it the other way, obviously. Yes, but that's trivial. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, good. Oh, and obviously uh, the same. Similarly, uh, similarly for mechanical equilibrium. Similarly, if both heat and volume. Can be exchanged. Then the equilibrium condition is T one equals T two and P one equals P two. And that's an exercise. You, you should. You need to be able to do this. Uh, it's done in Calvin, right? And finally, uh, especially if you're into chemistry, this is very important, but it's also important in phase transitions. Uh, if volume, heat, and particles can be exchanged,
then the equilibrium condition is T1 equals T2, P1 equals P2, and U1 equals U2. It's very easy to show, but this is in itself so very important. So the chemical potentials are equal at equilibrium. That means that any subsystem of your isolated system, if any particles move, if you just arbitrarily put a dotted, dotted box anywhere, then the part, number of particles moving into that box must equal the number of particles moving out. That's the chemical potential is equal. The driving force of the chemical potential could be anything. Any could be electrical, could be magnetic, anything. Okay. So that's obviously very important in chemistry. But it's, you'll see examples with um, metals and electrons and metals next, next semester. Okay. Chapter 3. Let me start on a new page. Page eight. What I call it. Chapter three. Now, the energy is an extensive parameter. Or it's just um, extensive. You anyway, know, that means that it's homogeneous order one. So lambda U of lambda S lambda V lambda N equals lambda u of s v n. Okay, so this is our starting point. Okay, that's the definition of um, homogeneous order one. Okay, there it is. So now, let's differenti differentiate both sides of the spectral lambda. So d by d lambda on the left hand side is so it's u is a function of lambda s. So using use chain rule, the u by d lambda s times d lambda s by d lambda plus similar d u d lambda v d lambda v by d lambda plus du by d lambda n d lambda n by d lambda and then d lambda s by d lambda is just s because you're differentiating with respect to lambda, okay. and S is basically a constant in this differentiation. So that's du by d lambda s times s plus du by d lambda v times v plus du by d lambda n times n, and this e equals d by d lambda on the right hand side and that you get immediately just different there's no this does not this is not a function of lambda at all so it's just a linear function of lambda so that's just u of s v n so this is true for all lambda not equal to zero. So I should say lambda is not equal to zero because you're not going to scale a system by zero that's not physical. So you can't just make it go away by conservation of, you know, choose any of your favorite conservation rules. So true for all lambda not equal to zero, but in particular, it's true 
for lambda equals 1. So let's write out this equation, see what we've got for lambda equals 1. So you put, there's our left hand side, put lambda equals 1 in there, and lambda equals, well, there's no lambda there, but let's just put lambda equals 1 in there. Therefore, du by ds times s, and obviously these are a constant v and n, okay, plus du by dv at constant s uh, n times v plus du by dn at constant uh, constant uh, s uh, v times n equals u. Oh, but hang on, we've got partial derivatives here of the energy with respect to its independent variables. T s plus, oops, minus P v plus mu n equals u. This is called the Euler equation. And it's in the energy representation. easy to, um, to get is S is 1 on T U plus P on T V minus mu on T N. Uh, so that reminds me, I think I might have, uh, I should have put a minus sign in the entropic intensive parameter. Just, just, just want to check that I wrote back here. So make sure that the entropic, entropic intensive parameter uh, is minus mu t. Yeah, it's definitely minus mu t. Yes. So, what does this tell us? What, what's that? That there is a partial derivative of the entropy function, that there is a partial derivative of the energy function. So if we have three equations of state, this one, this one, and this one, it means that if we substitute it in here, we have u as a function of n, v, and s. So, so this is the significance of it. If we have three equations of state, they could come from an experiment, they could come from some theory, if you just have three equations of state, you substitute them into the Euler equation to get, oh and you have to express them as, a fu as functions of S, V and N, or functions of U, V and N, that's the other thing. then substitute them these into the Euler equation 
And uh, I'll put in brackets here, after expressing them, in the appropriate variables. This is important, of course. You substitute, you express, express them in the appropriate variables, you substitute them into the order equation, and to obtain the fundamental relation So you see, what do, I, what do I mean by an equation of state is that you have t equals some function of s, v, and n, okay? Or it could be some t is some function of p something something, and then you have to mess around to change variables to s, v, and n, okay? And then you substitute it. So you've got to keep in mind that you have to express the the intensive parameter in the appropriate variables before you substitute it in. Huh? No, can you just integrate? No. You don't need to integrate it here. It's because it's given to you. Yeah, why do an integral when all you have to do is substitute it in? But this is easy, much easier. The integral might be impossible. Or you might only be able to do it numerically. What's the point? If you've got three equations of state, just put it into the order equation. Okay. But what if you only have two equations of state? And then now there are two, two ways to proceed. Two ways of obtaining the fundamental relation. One, use the Gibbs Gibbs dual relation. You may well ask, what is the Gibbs dual relation? Well, here we go. Let's derive it. In the energy representation, the Euler equation is u equals ts minus pv plus un. So in general, the differential G du would be comprised of tds plus sdt minus VDP minus PDV plus NDU plus UDN. Now let me just rewrite that, just group terms together. So let me group TDS there minus PDV, so that's that one there, and that one there, and that one there, plus UDN. And then here below, I'll write everything that's left. SDT minus VDP, that's a VDP, plus NDU. Now what? Huh? Assume something is false. No, no, no assumptions. This is completely general. This is this is Euler's theory of, of functions of several variables. 
You can Google it and have a look. What do you reckon? Can anyone recognise anything? No, no, no. no. Our definition of Very good. That there is du. du equals TDS minus P to V, P to v plus mu Yeah. That there, so that du cancels. You get zero. Oh, okay, you put in one more one more line. Okay, let's put in one more line. Du equals du plus SDT minus VDP plus NDU. Therefore, zero equals SDT minus VDP plus NDU. How is that DU from the start definition? This is this is a this is the first and second law of thermodynamics. Remember the, the how we define D? Oh okay. <coughs> oh okay, okay. DU equals TDS minus PDB plus PDN. There it is, and there you have it. This is called the Gibbs dual relation. Gibbs dual relation. What this is telling us is that out of three equations of state, Only two are independent. You see, here you have a, this is a differential function of TPU. It means that, let's say for example, SDT equals VDP minus ND mu. So that means that T is a function of P and mu. Well, this says that, you see, only two of these, only two of T, P, U can be independent because all that equals zero. If you go along this, a surface, um, then um, the, 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 the temperature is the, is the slope of the energy surface. The pressure is basically, minus the pressure is the slope of um, the energy surface in, in another direction. The, mu is the slope of the energy surface in another direction. Those slopes, out of those three slopes, only two are independent. Again, this is a fact from differential geometry, but it's completely relevant to any you know, chemical experiment or physics experiment that you would use in material science. Yeah. If you have three equations of state, only two are independent. If you have um, only three, if you have uh, three uh, thermodynamic variables. Okay. So. So. So if you know two of them, then you can find the third. And guess what? When you have three gradients of state, what do you do? Substitute into the Euler equation. Then when you know three, <coughs> equations of state, you substitute into the 
boilerplate to get the fundamental relation. So that's the recipe, right? And two, the second way. What you do is use the molar form of the fundamental relation that you want. So for example, ds is 1 on t d little, this is little s plus p on t d little v this is the entropy representation obviously the entropy representation because that there, 1 on t is the intensive parameter corresponding to the derivative of the entropy with respect to u. P on t is a derivative, is a slope of the entropy in the direction of the volume. So the recipe, hang on, so, so you see you only need, only need two equations of state. There and there. So the convenient one to leave out, the convenient uh, variable to leave out is the number of moles. So in other words, if, imagine you, you can you, you just have a fixed number of moles of substance, say even one mole, something standard. And then you integrate ds to get the molar s, and then you have to replace the number of moles, because you need it to find the chemical potential. So you integrate ds to get little s of u, little v, little u, little v, uh, which is defined as big S of, at this stage, little u, little v, over n, it's not the finest, is it, is it equal to? That's what you actually have, because at the moment you don't have the number of moles in the argument here. You imagine when, if you're actually working this out, the, the number of moles doesn't appear here. So once you integrate it, you've still got something missing. The number of moles missing here. Then you must rewrite this in terms of of u capital u capital v capital n so that's so in other words uh, especially that there needs to go into the argument of the entropy function and the other example of course is just well it's not an example it's just the other thing that can happen is du equals t d little s minus p d little v in the energy representation. Basically, basically the same recipe, uh, but you still you see you just got one equation of state there, one equation of state there. You substitute whatever t is in terms of s and v, whatever minus p is in terms of s and v, and you integrate that. So, Professor, yep. all of these properties are emerged from the fact that U is an extensive quantity. Well, that's, it's all important, but that is one of the important properties. As in, we wouldn't have the, the, the gibbs theorem relations if we, didn't, if we didn't have that. Because the lambda then wouldn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to do the lambda. If H bar was just slightly different, then we wouldn't exist and you wouldn't be thinking about it. <laughs> well, here we are, thinking about it. So this is how things are. 
Example uh, 221. So this is just the example in Kellen. I'll just work through it. Um, so, for example, example. So, uh, what's this one? Two past. Not very long to go. Oh, just, just, just a little bit. Little. U of S V N equals K K S cubed over N V. So T is the U by the S a constant V N. Uh, U by the S a constant V N. Uh, so that's uh, 3 times k s squared on nv. So here you have t as a function s and nv. Um, and by the way, this, this, is, this is finished here, but I want to tell you a trick that can save you a lot of work. And that is that you know, this is the basic answer you want. This is t as a function of s, v, and n. Which is, which is what you want. But there's a trick, and that is, you can, you can go one step further. If I write this as ks cubed on nv, in other words, what I started off with there, if I have an s cubed there, it means I have to divide by s, and, um, and I have to multiply by three to get the three there. So divide, if I divide by, that by s, I get that. If I multiply by 3, I get that. And that is the u that we started, and it's 3u over s. Now that is also useful in calculations, because instead of having uh, a huge number of terms here, in general this can be a huge quantity, a very large expression. This can be a large expression, but you reuse the initial um, definition of u to rewrite the expression in a short way. This is the answer that we want for the equation of state. But for calculations, this next this step here can be useful. Okay. Uh, minus p, and you can find minus p and u. Uh, that's very straightforward. Okay. Okay. Now, example two, three, one. We're given the molar internal energy is some constant times little s to the 512. That's little s. Little v to the half. Okay. And he asked, find, and he asked, find the fundamental relation. In fact, you ask, the question says, the required, required to find S of U, sorry, little u, little v. Okay. So we've got molar quantities. We need to find uh, um, I just want to check the actual wording of the example. Which page is it on? Um, 42. Oh, okay. We need the entropy representation. Oh, yeah. So it's, um, so it's this one here. Find the three equations of state in the entropy representation. So you're given that you need the entropy representation. So 
be given that. So that's that's a big goal uh, for a system with this fundamental equation. Okay. Okay. So. So um, and the entropy representation. Um, so you need to find the molar entropy. So you have to uh, isolate the molar entropy in this equation. So um, so s. So that implies that s to the five one two is some other constant times u v to the half. Now these constants just you don't just don't worry about writing them out explicitly. You might get some bunch of experimental quantities here. Just replace them with a k hat or whatever. Okay, don't worry about writing them out. Okay, so um, then it's s to the five one two to the two fifths equals k u v to the half to the two fifths. Okay, I'm saying k equals one on k hat here, obviously. Um, so s equals um, k to the two fifths, u to the two fifths, v to the one fifth. So now we've got the molar entropy. Okay, and the equations of state. One on T is d little s by d little u at constant little v. So you just um, you just differentiate it. Um, P on T equals ds by d little v at constant little u. You just differentiate it. Now this one you'll find that you get f1 of little u and u little v, and this one is a function of little u, little v, molar quantities. These are molar quantities. And let me write this out actually. So it's going to be k to the two fifths ds by du. So it's going to be two fifths one on u to the three-fifths and actually I should put the uh, let, let me let me group the group it together two constants v to the one-fifth in this one one uh, two-fifths one on u to the three-fifths so what I'm also showing you is a good way of setting them out so here I've put the powers like that I haven't left it like that, I've actually written out each power because I know I'm going to differentiate with respect to each variable eventually. So that's that, and this one is um, ds by dv, so k to the two fifths, u to the two fifths, one fifth, one on v to the four fifths. Um, so that's so there are two equations of state, but the question asks you for three equations of state. For arbitrary n. Okay. So now you have to replace n. Okay. First of all, what's the target, or what, what's what do you have to do? You must eventually calculate. mu on t, is, which is the, now this is capital S, minus mu t. Well, capital, yeah, minus mu on t, u, v. So what you have to do, you, you must convert, so you need to convert little s of little u, little v, to big S of big U, big V, big N. <coughs> so
So little s equals k to the two fifths, u to the two fifths, v to the one fifth, and little s is big S over n, little u equals big U over big N, little v equals big V over big N. You substitute them in, so you've got big S over N equals K to the two fifths, big U to the two fifths, over N to the two fifths, big V to the one fifth, N to the one fifth, and that implies S of U V N is K to the two fifths, U to the two fifths, V to the one fifth. Now N's going to go to here. Uh, N's going to say so you got N to the three fifths there, so you end up having N to the two fifths. Um, that's now you see you've converted. You've got the the um, extensive entropy now, not the molar entropy. And just do a check. Um, that, is it homogeneous order one? Yeah. Well, if you put lambda u in there, uh, you get lambda to the two fifths. Lambda v, you get lambda to the one fifth lambda to the two fifths from there, so that's lambda out there. So that means um, you get S of lambda U, lambda V, lambda N equals lambda S. So it's properly extensive, so it looks like you haven't made any silly mistakes. Okay. Does it, um, you, do you want, you no, know, I'm, I'm not gonna write that out because it's straightforward, but you should write it out. Okay? Yeah. So it's a self consistency check. Alright, and now, finally, mu on t, minus mu on t. You've got to check if that minus sign is there. Look, I think it is. Uh, is ds by dn at constant u and v equals just exercise. Okay, so now we've got three equations of state. So we've solved the problem. The last example, final example. Let's see, page 64, 65. So we're given U equals half PB, and we're given T squared equals a constant U to the 3 on 2 over V N to the half, and A is a positive constant. And the question is, uh, find, okay, uh, yeah, find the fundamental relation. That's the question. So, before you can apply the recipe, you've got to figure out are we in the energy representation or the entropy representation? First question. Are we in the energy representation or entropy representation? Entropy. How do you know? How do you know it's the entropy representation? There's no there's no there's no there's no right. These must be equations of state, and none of these equations of state have an S in them, only U. So all we have is 
U, whatever, U, V, N, whatever the fundamental relation is, it's got to be a function of U, V, and N. And the one that we, so that has to be entropy. It has to be U, V, and N in there. Must be entropy rep. Because S does not appear in the equations of state. So, what do we need to do next? The third. The third. The you need to write down the equation of state. So what do you have on the left-hand side of an equation of state? We have the, the temperature and pressure. Uh, not necessarily temperature and pressure. The intensive parameter. The intensive parameter. To proceed, we must write the intensive parameters, write down the intensive parameters in the entropy representation. So for example, we need one on T, we're given T squared equals a constant times U to the 3 on 2 V n to the half. So take square roots on both sides. So that's A to the half U to the, this is 2, U to the 3 quarters of V to the half N to the 1 quarter. And so 1 on T, just get 1 on T in any way you can. Anyway, so 1 on t is v to the half, n to the quarter, of a to the half, u to the three quarters, which is a function of u, v, and n. U, v, u, v, n. Good. What else do we need? p on t. <coughs> p of u, v, n. T. But what are we given? That we, we need to get P on T somehow. But here we got the first equation of state has U P V in it. The second one has T U V N in it. Somehow we need P on T. Get it in any way. P on T. P on T is P times one on T. So this is where your this is where creativity comes in. Just any way. So that's uh, from here. That's just two u and v. Times one on t v to the half into the quarter. A to the half, U to the three quarters. And just simplify, that gives you, so U to the quarter, that's there, um, N to the one quarter, V to the half, and there's A to the half here. So, now we have two equations of state, but three variables, u, v, and n. So, 
we're missing one equation of state. So let's use the molar form of the first law to get the molar entropy S of UV. So DS is 1 on T DU plus P on T DV. And so N equals 1, say. We could say that we've divided by N everywhere, or we could just say that N equals 1. Well, we know what 1 on T is because we worked it out. We know what P on T is because we just worked it out. So it's V, and I've divided by little V. Uh, but divided by N. I'll put N equals 1 here, in fact. The easiest way here is to put N equals 1 in there, and, um, and just put little V's. Oops, N equals 1 in there, and put little, and, and put in, uh, put in uh, small v and small u. So that's v to the half. And if you don't believe me that that works, you can, you can divide everything by uh, n and see what happens. Uh, v to the half, a to the half, little u to the three quarters to u, plus 2u to the one quarter a to the half, v to the half, dv. Now at this stage, it's important to make sure that what is here, the variables in here are u and v, they're the same as the variables of the differentials, u and v. Same here, the variables are u and v, the differentials are u and v. You have to make sure of that, otherwise it's not integrable. Okay. So now this is, this is uh, you are hoping that this is integrable. If it's not integrable, then this can't be a potential, can't, it can't be a, like a conservative system of mechanics. So anyway, so I'll just get rid of that a to the half there. And um, I'll just go v to the half, just rewrite this in a trivial way, u to the 3 quarters du plus 2u to the 1 quarter v to the half dv. And the trick is, we want, we, we, we want to integrate that, we want to write that sum as as the product, like a product rule, derivative of something here gives that using uh, using chain rule and product rule. Or product. So, what you need to do is to find some combination of u and v in here that gives you that plus that. So now, u to the fourth. So. What, what power of u do you think is in here? V to, u to the fourth and v to the half. U to the a quarter. Uh, quarter. U to the quarter and v to the... So u to the quarter, if you differentiate u to the quarter, you would get a quarter u uh, to the minus three quarters, which is, there's a u to the minus three quarters. So you'd want uh, four, because that's a one there. Four u to the quarter v to the half. So if you have four u to the quarter v to the half, if you differentiate that with respect to u, that would give you four times a quarter u to the minus three quarters times v to the half du, which is that term there. And then different, add using product rule plus derivative with respect to v would just give half v to the minus a half times 4u to the quarter dv, and that's that. So that's the correct antiderivative of that. Yeah. 
So, oh, well, not antiderivative. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So that getting from there to there, you know, there are general methods, and you're welcome to use them. But you know, once we're here, integrate both sides. Little s is one on is like okay, four on a to the half u to the quarter v to the half plus constant of integration s zero. So now we have little s as a function of little 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 s as a function of little u and little v. Finally, find big S as a function of u, big U, big V, and V n, which is the fundamental relation, and that's an exercise. Yep. How do you determine the constant of integration? You don't. Not in thermodynamics. But then we said it should be first order homogeneous. So yeah. there shouldn't be constant of integration. Oh. Or it didn't make a difference. If you multiply by n. That's going to be that's s over n equals four a to the half v u on n the quarter big v on big n to the half plus yeah, zero. That implies big s equals four a to the half. N to the quarter, U to the quarter, V to the half, plus N S to And that's extensive. So the constant of integration is extensive because of that comes from yeah. there. Okay. Last thing to check. Is this uh, is this homogeneous order one? Put lambda n in there, lambda u, lambda v, lambda the quarter, lambda the quarter, lambda the half gives lambda. So that's going to mean that s is extensive. So it looks like there is uh, there have been no algebraic errors. Yep. Okay, sir, we know that one over t is d s by d u. So can we uh, integrate with respect to u, for example? And then with the other equation, integrate that and reconcile both equations? So we integrate du by ds. Uh, we integrate ds by du. ds by du, yeah. With respect to u. And, and then, then you get an unknown function of v and n. And then integrate the other ones and reconcile. But you, you're going to get uh, an unknown function of v and n there, and you integrate the other equation of state in another unknown function of um, u and n. And how do you how do you determine those unknown functions? If you, if sometimes it would be obvious to find it. Really intuitive. I mean, it, it may be possible. Uh, it may be it may work. But I wouldn't want to mess around with trying to find, trying to uh, determine those unknown functions. Because you're going to need another equation anyway, at least. You need the end equation. Yeah. So you may as well just do this. Yeah. Okay.
So, um, there you uh, have the next installment of thermodynamics. Okay. As you see, it's just all uh, geometry. And Euler worked this stuff out. Uh, when, when did he live? Look it up. Look up homogeneous order one and homogeneous order zero and where the, where the terms come from. And you'll see that it's Euler's theory of surfaces. Okay. And it just happens that properties of matter and you know, thermodynamic systems have these have the same um, mathematical structure, which is which seems miraculous actually, which is pretty incredible. Okay, so that'll do for today.